Hello all! Rick here with a look into the ship designs of the Picard era, the turn of the 25th century. Watching through the evolution of Starfleet as portrayed in the series led to an observation. The ship variety in the fleet is greater than any other time we've seen in the Star Trek history, but I think these can be categorised into four separate design paths. These paths are created by the real-world developments of the design behind them, but then further adapted and supported by in-universe lore, drawn from the shows and beyond. So I want to talk on these differing origins of the early 25th century Starfleet and see how my observations hold up. The first type of starship we see are what I'm going to term the Old Guard. Starfleet's always maintained a supplement of vessels from its prior generation of design, and while the time between the launch of the Excelsior and the introduction of TNG era ships is longer than the time between the Sovereign's intro and the start of the 25th century, it's still a similar principle. These older ships are still not only serviceable, but still excel in certain areas and will continue to do so for some time, eventually taking lighter and lighter duties until they are eventually retired from service. The Excelsior, for example, served as a top-of-the-line exploration craft before being assigned more and more logistical and diplomatic duties. Ignoring its last hurrah during the Dominion War, this is the standard path for a lot of Starfleet ships. The more adaptable of the lines will be maintained and updated with new tech for as long as they can until something about the initial design is no longer compatible with current advancements. Then that line is ended. In the era of Star Trek Picard, the Excelsior and Miranda classes are long gone but we still have the prevalence of Akira and Sovereign-class starships. Both of these vessels served particularly well as defensive ships, but the Sovereign in particular maintains the diplomatic suites and can still reach a high warp factor of 9.98-ish, which keeps it in the upper echelons of even the 25th century Starfleet ships. I more or less expect it to be occupying the role that the aged Excelsior was. The Akira still acts as a potent patrol craft, but likely no longer is deployed into hostile encounters as a first choice. Instead, from the examples we see of the USS Avalon, it was simply on local patrol when it was diverted by the emergence of unexpected phenomena. It would not surprise me to learn that the Akira ships were now pretty much assigned on patrol missions around local areas. As Starfleet tech moves on too, it's mostly the Klingon and Romulan tech that has kept pace with the Federation, so even a 30-year-old Akira class is still going to pack more firepower than your standard pirates. Other classes might fade into disuse far sooner, but it makes sense that we would see a couple of notable exceptions still in service. Plus, for realism purposes, it helps the show direct a continuation of the fleet and makes it more believable to observe older ships still in use, even generating nostalgia for these decades-old craft. The next ship category is one that I'll term the evolutions of starships. This is where I'm going to put ships like the Inquiry, Dudastat, and the Sagan class. These vessels are what you get if you continue the design styles that we last saw in Starfleet's TNG era, the year 2379. Ships of around this time had become lower in profile and darker in colour. Compare the oval roundness of the galaxy to later ships and you can definitely see the emergence of more angular designs that, while smooth, were more, well, blade-like. Whereas the Galaxy class you can picture cresting the waves almost, cruising along, the Sovereign slices through them. If I place the Sagan alongside the Sovereign and Saber starships, surely you should see the similarities. The whole coloration, the smoothed blockiness of the nacelles, and the cutting edge of the saucer. These ships look like a continuation of the designs and technology of the 2370s, and that is pretty much what they are. The technology inside includes devices that first debuted in the TNG era, such as metaphasic shielding, as well as the aesthetics, products of the end of the 24th century and the Dominion War. The third category of ships is a bit of a more unique one in that they are what extraneous law refers to as sixth generation technology starships, or simply the Star Trek Online style vessels. This includes the Alita, Gagarin, Sutherland, and even the Odyssey class Star Cruiser. Star Trek Online is set in its own universe, derived still from the timeline of past shows for sure, but in a separate years of 2409 to 2411. However, the game has been around for 14 years, as of writing this, longer than the absence of Star Trek from the small screen. You know, I kind of want to do a video covering some of the earlier STO designs, they got weird. Anyway. 
For the longest time, it was the only real glimpse into a new era of Starfleet ship design, jumping a decade deep into the 25th century. Therefore, a distinct visual style emerged, not overnight, but eventually, and I think beginning with the Odyssey class design, setting many of the precedents. Key features of this style included the near white and black colour scheme, more smoothed out lines and vivid lighting, as well as higher levels of hull livery than we saw with Dominion War era ships. These ships emerged in STO in waves over the years, each looking as if it belonged to a new image of what Starfleet was considering standard. The Odyssey class always sort of reminded me of an orca with its coloration, organic shapes and sheer size. This was continued in later designs that, while varied, became readily identifiable even amid extensive changes. Nacelle style, hull shape and deflectors all vary from ship to ship, but two constants remain. The coloration and the fact that things end up looking more curved and tapered off. While personally I like the look of many of these ships, it is a somewhat more drastic departure from the look of ships from 20 or 30 years ago. Again, if I were to line up a Sovereign, Sagan and Sutherland class and ask you which one is the odd one out, I think you could easily see what I'm on about. While this became standard for Star Trek Online's 25th century, that universe has its own design lineage and history now, separate from the shows, with years of real life and even in-universe iteration to end up where it is. Importing ships from STO into canon of the series, it's a great idea to quickly bolster the fleet, as well as being an inclusive nod towards an easily overlooked area of Trek lore. However, it cannot be denied that some of these designs do look rather unique. In the Apocrypha surrounding Picard, this distinctive look needs to be explained away, and it is. While not covered in the shows, there exists a developmental line within Starfleet based on the premise of sixth generation technology. That being that Starfleet occasionally undergoes bursts of reinvention in its design phases. NX to TOS, TOS to movies, movies to next generation, TNG to the Dominion War, and now the next step in innovation. This includes features that are mentioned in the shows, such as advanced automation, but also the reasoning for more cosmetic changes, such as new hull composites that had a distinctive look to them. This categorises them rather neatly into a single category, but not every STO ship that originates here can fit into this style. For example, the now canonical Ross class, which very much sits in the previous category of evolved ship design in that it clearly draws its inspiration from Sovereign and Galaxy designs. The final wave of Picard era ships are the ones I'll refer to as nostalgic Starfleet. This is the most meta wave of the lot, both in universe and for real life purposes. Designers looked back into the history of starships from the Federation and asked themselves, what is a classic Starfleet ship? Out of universe, the answer I would contest is the Constitution in any form. It's literally the poster for the fleet, while in universe, I would say this is also true. However, I think that if you were to ask an alien culture in Star Trek to identify a Federation starship, most would say the Excelsior class. It was so heavily featured and operated in a prominent position for so long that I can imagine, to many, the Excelsior is the obvious Starfleet ship. So when Picard and Starfleet emerges from an era of looking inwards, being defensive and more callous than normal, they needed a pledge to show the rest of the galaxy that Starfleet was back to being Starfleet. The Dominion War, the attack on Mars, and all that trauma was finally beginning to heal and in turn, they were getting back to their roots. Which, to some designers, means looking back at older ships and trying to recapture that magic. This led to the main vessels in this category, the Constitution Mark III and the Excelsior Mark II. If you wanted to shift the Sagan class into this category too, I would not argue. But although that vessel is built for a homage to the constellation, with the Stargazer carrying the same name even, it's definitely a new class. The Constitution and Excelsior are literally reinventions of the classics, sharing the same names too. They are there to do similar things as their legacy classes did and overtly promise a more classic Starfleet to come, operating alongside the newer innovations. So what do you think? Are these categories I have made too arbitrary? I think that this era of Star Trek definitely has the most variation in fleets that we've seen in canon. Of course, outside of the shows, there are extensive variations in classes that never appear on screens, but I'm referring to just what we've seen here. 
This boom in design styles is very much a product of the times. Star Trek ships have historically been created from models with variations emerging through kitbashing existing designs together. In the original series, every other starship was a constitution class, but as soon as there was a bigger budget for the movie era the Connie was overhauled, and then in subsequent films we started to get new variations in the fleet. Moving into TNG, we got the extensive reuse of older ships for a long time too, until the fleet of Wolf 359 demanded a greater degree of variety. So we got a bunch of kitbash ships made from galaxy class parts. One-legged galaxy, three-legged galaxy, flat galaxy, flat galaxy, balancing of saucer, and so on. I think that observation has been made before, but it's true. It does lead to easily placing ships in their appropriate eras, but does it also hamper creativity somewhat? Now we are well into the era of 3D modelling and digital ships. The crafting of designs can be far more varied than ever before. Given the history and availability and evolution of the design process over the years, I find the latest depiction of such a varied fleet to be the most likely product of something like the Federation. The UFP, for whom infinite diversity in infinite combinations is a core principle and celebrated. I think we have the clear core evolution of design in the starships we see, but with these other styles it makes more sense when the Federation pursues multiple avenues of development. You can say that during the TNG era the Galaxy class nacelles proved to be the best design, so they were commonly adopted to the exclusion of everything else. But with over 150 member planets and 2,000 affiliated worlds, is there really only one optimal design? Why did the Andorian style battleship fade out of use? What about the Vulcan warp ring? The greater variety of ships and even development families emerging is far more believable to me. So I think this to be the four design styles of ship that are in operation within the 25th century of Star Trek. Just to clarify, I'm not saying older eras of ships do not have their standout designs. I mean, my favourite ship is still the original Excelsior class that was designed before I was even born. But I'm glad that we are getting a chance to see more schools of design entering Trek lore, and ultimately, I think that's a good thing. Thanks for watching this analysis. I've been Rick, and I'll see you later for another video. Until then, goodbye.